Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today we will study 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you missed any of our previous studies, you can always go to our website. It is kuim.org or to our SoundCloud or YouTube cloud or YouTube channel. It is uh, Simple Truth Gospel uh, with Kirian. So before we continue, let's have um, a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for another opportunity for your children to gather, to glean to your word. We ask you that you will speak to us today through your word. Dear Spirit of God, I pray that you will give us revelation knowledge, understanding of the scriptures. Only you can unveil the revelation behind the word of God to us. We trust you to minister to each and every one of us simultaneously, wherever we are tonight. Help us to understand what you're trying to give us tonight. You are the spirit of truth. Help us to separate your word, the word of Christ, from human doctrine. We always propose to be doers of the word of God, and we cannot do this on our own, so we trust you to empower us. Father God, I pray that you will help us to understand that the gospel cannot end with us. Teach us how to turn many to righteousness how to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Teach us how to be, each and every one of us, how to be an oasis of love to the troubled world, an oasis of light to the world that is full of darkness. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name we give glory, praise, thanksgiving, for all that you've done and continue to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, today we will start um, First Thessalonians. Uh, before we continue, let me give you some background. Uh, the book of uh, Thessalonians was written by Paul, and he wrote this book uh, from Corinth. It was written about uh, 50 to 51 AD. It is believed to be Paul's first epistle, and it is an uh, eschatological epistle in the sense that it talks about things that are yet to come, like the rapture of the church and the tribulation that follows. You remember when Paul and uh, Barnabas wanted to start their second missionary journey, uh, they had a sharp contention because Barnabas wanted to take uh, John Mark, who left them in their first missionary journey. So Paul disagreed with him, and as a result of this, they parted their ways. So Barnabas took um, uh, 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 John Mark and went to Cyprus, whereas Paul took um, Silas and then went back to the places they visited during their first missionary journey. When they got to Dobi, uh, Timothy joined them. And when, when they got to Troas, they wanted to go to Britannia, but the Spirit of God forbade them. So Paul had a vision at night, and he saw a man in that vision who said, come over to Macedonia and help us. So they believed that God was calling them to the area of Macedonia. So they went to the area of Macedonia. The first city they visited was uh, Philippi. It was believed that uh, Luke joined them at Philippi. And um, 
uh, on the Sabbath day, they went to the river banks because they didn't have enough uh, Jewish men in this city to start a synagogue. You, you should have at least 10 Jewish men to start a synagogue. Uh, so they met, the, the women met uh, at the riverside. And you remember uh, Lydia, the seller of purple, was one of them. And uh, when Paul delivered the young girl who was possessed with the spirit of divination, uh, it started a lot of trouble for them. You know, they were beaten and they were thrown into jail with stocks in, in their feet. At night when they were praying and they were singing, the whole place shook and uh, the, the, the stocks fell off. The, the guard wanted to kill himself, but Paul said, don't do that because we are still here. And um, after they left Philippi, the next city they went to was Thessalonica. And uh, 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 because um, uh, uh, they, 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 in Thessalonica, they spent um, three Sabbath days, which is like three weeks. Paul spent three Sabbath days reasoning with them at the synagogue, the Jews. And, 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 and some of the proselytes that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But uh, at some point, some of the Jews became envy, envious of what Paul was saying, and they started trouble. So they have to leave town, you know, and they went to uh, Berea. Even while they were in Berea, these Jews again started trouble. And now they had to, Paul had to uh, uh, go to Athens and he left uh, uh, Silas and Luke behind, and, uh, Silas and Timothy behind. So now when they met him at Athens, Paul decided to send Timothy back to Thessalonica to go and see the way, what's going on with this uh, new convert. So he went to Corinth with um, uh, Luke and uh, Silas. While he was uh, at Corinth, uh, Timothy came back from Thessalonica and uh, gave him the progress note of this church. It was a positive one, a good one indeed. So Paul had to write them this letter from Corinth just to address certain issues that came up as a result of their teaching while they were there. So this is a summary. I know it's a long summary, but it will help you, you know, put things together. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and start. Verse 1, it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul um, uh, relates. You can see that um, uh, he, he joined um, uh, Silvanus here, which is the, the Greek form of uh, Silas, and also Timothy. He joined them in his greeting to this church. And here you can see that he is relating Jesus Christ with God, the Father. There are so many people who don't believe, you know, even some Christians, the deity of Jesus Christ. There are some who say that Jesus Christ is just a sub-God, that I, at some point he became a God, but uh, deity left him after a while. He, sometimes you can hear some people will knock at your door with uh, some literature in their hands. And then they will try to get to the, the point where they will tell you uh, the Bible says that he was the firstborn of all creation. And they will say, see here, Jesus Christ is not God. He is just the firstborn, you know. So uh, they, they try to bring so many arguments just to refute the fact that Jesus Christ is God. It, Paul would be blaspheming if he would relate Jesus Christ here to, 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 to God the Father. So, the Bible tells us that he is the express image of God. He is the one with preeminence 
So that's how you explain to them when they tell you that uh, the Bible says he is the first create uh, from uh, first uh, born of all creation. You just tell them that uh, that word there means preeminence. Protorokos is the Greek word. It means the first one in order, the first one in rank, the one that has the authority. So Jesus Christ is God. He testified this himself. He said, I and my father are one. If you see me, you've seen the father. And this has been a hindrance to so many people, even the Jews. And there are some who want to have access with, to, to God the Father. And they're trying to go around it, around Jesus. And the uh, Bible tells us there is only one mediator. One mediator. There is one God, one mediator between man and God. And this is the man Jesus Christ. You cannot have access to the Father God without Jesus Christ. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. You cannot reject Jesus and say that you have access to God, the creator of the heaven and the earth. It is impossible, the Bible tells us. So he says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two reasons I believe that Paul will always use this. It's, uh, a, a, a typic, it's typical of a Pauline uh, salutation. You will see it always in this order. Grace and peace. The first reason I believe is because of his audience. You know, the Grecians will always greet. Charis, which means uh, 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 grace. And then the, the, the Jews will greet Shalom, which means peace. So he brings these uh, two uh, 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 people together. Remember the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ has broken the partition between the Jews and the Greeks. So therefore, there is no more Jews nor Gentiles. So all we are one now in Christ Jesus. The second reason I believe is this. Until you understand and you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will not have the peace of God. Now you will have peace with God because that was established by what Jesus Christ did. But until you understand the grace of God, then you are saved by faith. That God's love towards you, his uh, mercies towards you, his protection towards you is not predicated upon your good efforts and the way that you live your life. Until you understand this, every day you will live in fear, thinking that when you miss it, God is going to use a hammer from heaven and he hit you right on the head. You know, some people, you know, they, they fear, they fear that because they are depending upon their own good works. So until you understand that everything that you receive from God that is called grace, you got to do it by faith. It's not because of the way you act. It's because of what Jesus Christ did. And the moment you come to this acknowledgement, you will have the peace of God with you. So this is the reason, the second reason I believe that Paul writes in this manner. We continue in verse 2. He says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and uh, Father. So Paul being a man of prayer, always praying. If you watch his, uh, read um, his epistles, you will see many times he prayed for the saints. Here he's praying again. He's uh, thanking God for the progress that this church, there is only six months. About this time, this church is about six months old. The progress that they are making. Many people, many men, who were used mightily in the New Testament were people of prayer. Because if prayer is fellowship with God, if you want to be used by God, be a person of prayer. Prayer is fellowship with God. It is becoming one with God. It is a dialogue 
we speak to God and then we listen to what he got to tell us. Understand that people who are growing in faith, at some point they will become more of listening than speaking. Some of us, we just, when we pray, we just speak and speak and speak and speak and speak. And you can imagine the little we know, the understanding, the little understanding we have. But we want to talk, talk, talk to the person who knows everything. So you get to a point in your Christian maturity when you listen more. Because when you listen, then God is giving you his mind. While you are listening, he's communicating to you his plan. What he wants to be done. And uh, when you listen, you become that channel through which he will do these things that he wants to be done. So people who, the uh, mighty people you found in the Bible, they are men and women of prayer. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now Paul is thanking God. For three things. And you can notice that uh, in some other epistles, he will bring these two things, these three things together. Uh, love, faith, and hope. And in Corinthians, it says, this abides. He says, law of faith, hope, and the love. He says, this three, but love is the greatest. Now he's talking about those three things again. The first one he, 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 he the first one here he mentioned is uh, your work of faith. So what is the meaning of work of faith? When you get born again, you get born again through faith. What God already made available through Christ Jesus, you receive it by faith. So, the root of salvation is grace by faith. You don't do anything to earn it. It's a free gift of God. You just receive it by faith. But after you get born again, the faith that you use when you get born again is supposed to be alive and active faith. A faith that will produce a corresponding action. James says, faith without works is dead. So this faith, by the power of the Holy Ghost, is supposed to be a, a, a transparent in your lifestyle. People will leave, look at you and they will notice something different. Now you are living a life that is conformed to the image of Christ. This is what he's talking about here, the work of faith. There is an evidence that you got born again. And this is seen in the way you live your life. Christian life. A life of love. A life that reflects Christ every day. The way you speak and the way you act. So this church is already making this progress. Paul is so excited. So he gives thanks to God for this progress. The second one is labor of love. So the word here, labor, means want to work, uh, 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 to weariness, to the point of exhaustion. And you can see this with, uh, with, with uh, 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 mothers at home. You see, uh, 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 they, sometimes they wake up very early and they start doing things in the house. You know, helping the children, preparing meals and all that kind of stuff. In the, even at the point when they are tired, very tired at night. But because of the love they have for the children, for the family, they still go that extra mile to put food on the table, to, 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 to prepare the dinner, to, to, to do so many other things. So, for the reason of love. So what is he telling us here? That what we do for the kingdom of God must be motivated by love. This is the only thing that God will accept. When we advance the kingdom of God, 
it must be motivated by love. Love for Christ Jesus. We are responding to what he did for us. Because the Bible said we love him because he first loved us. So what we do is we are responding to the love which he already bestowed upon us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible talks about if I offer my body to be born and I do it because of other arterial motives, I don't do it because of love of Christ. He says, you will profit me nothing. Everything we do for the kingdom of God must be because we love Christ. The Bible says the love of Christ constrains us. That is the motivation. We're not doing it because we want to be seen. Jesus Christ says, do not do your righteous uh, uh, works before men to be seen by men. He says, because if you do so, you've already received your reward. On the last day, people will come to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did so many miracles in your name. And Jesus will look up at them and say, get behind me, he says, he will tell them. He says, for I know you not, you workers of iniquity. Why? Because the motive was wrong. So he tells us here that uh, whatever we do for the kingdom of God, it must be because we love Christ Jesus. Now, the next one he talks about here is patience of hope. What does that mean? Now, there are twofold applications to this. Number one is hope. Patience of hope is waiting upon God. When we pray, Waiting upon God. Waiting is something that is very difficult to do. You remember when you go to the doctor's office and you got to wait in that room <laughs> before somebody will come and, uh, you know, <laughs> attend to you, or before the doctor will come and attend to you. You know, and while you are waiting there, you are bothered. You know, you want them to come right away. You don't want to wait too long. The same way, you know, it is difficult to wait upon the Lord. But that is the best way to Approach God. You got to wait for God. Don't give God time limits and say, I give it till Sunday or Monday. If you don't go, God, if you don't come through, I'm going to break that door myself. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes this insinuates, you know, what we do, how we act when we pray and we're waiting upon God. For the simple reason that you don't see the other side of that door that you want to break down. <laughs> but God sees. Bible says he, 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 he knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything. So he sees what is over there. And the door that you are trying to break down, on the side of it could be destruction and death and calamity. So we wait upon the Lord in patience. We want to be like those who through patience and faith inherited the promises of God. Because if you believe that God, he loves you so much that he will always give to you that which is best for you. Then you will understand that when you don't get an answered prayer, it is a thing of thanksgiving. Because God knows why. He sees the end from the beginning. But we are limited. You see, we live in time range. But God lives outside time. He sees everything. And uh, when we don't get our answers, it is very, very imperative that we wait upon God with joy and thanksgiving, knowing that he covers us, that he is walking behind the scene. At the same time, he's moving everything that is in that scene that all things will always work together for your good. That he will always give you that which is abundant and which will exceed any thought that can come across your mind. 
when you when you come to this uh, 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 assurance, when you settle with this mindset, then you will know that uh, if you are willing to wait forever, you're not going to be waiting too long, my friend. So, the second application is waiting for the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, would descend from heaven with a shout, with a shout of an archangel, with a trumpet of God. And he says, The dead in Christ shall be raised first. And we who are alive and still remain will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with him. The Bible tells us there is a day when this body here that decays, this body here that is sold in dishonor, that it will be raised in glory. When the corruption will put on incorruption, he says there's going to be a day like that. So this church, they already got to this point, expecting the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we will be in his own presence, when this uh, earthly tent will be pulled away and it will be clothed with that building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There is a day and we will live expecting this day. It is a glorious thing to know that this place we are is a temporary place. When we are troubled all around, when there is confusion and conflicts, and, and there is persecution, and there is uh, tribulations and trials, stand fit. Do not be moved. Understand there is one who is coming very soon. And it's not going to be too long. I don't know how long, but it's not going to be too long. The Bible tells us. And when that day comes, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be in the presence of Almighty God. Glory, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. So now we are in um, verse 4. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Here, he's telling them, this young church, at Thessalonica, that they were chosen by God before the foundation of the earth. This is the doctrine of divine election and the human volition. So many Christians, they find it difficult to understand this doctrine. But the Bible tells us the doctrine of uh, divine election, that we were chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth. Now, God created you and I as a free mortal agents, which means he gave us the right to make decisions. And he will always respect that right. And you think that God himself cannot make his own choice? <laughs> if he has given you the right to make choice? Let me break it down this way. Let me connect the dots. God's uh, Divine election is based upon his uh, foreknowledge. Like I said earlier, he sees the end from the beginning. So he knows the people that will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and then they will lift up their hands and say, Amen, I receive him as my Lord and Savior. And then he checks their name. He is omniscient, he knows everything. So this is the reason why he can, I, he, the Bible can boldly tell us that uh, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the earth. Someone will say, if that is true, then why would God judge somebody who did not, he, who, whom he did not choose? Let me give you um, uh, uh, some um, uh, 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 parallel passages in the Bible. In, um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, For we, were, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. 
so that we will. He says, those things which God ordained beforehand that we should do them. We are his own workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, that we will fulfill those things which God before, beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. Jesus Christ said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should be a fruit and that your fruit should remain. In um, Romans chapter um, 8, verse 29, I believe, it says, to whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Speaking to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you as a prophet unto the nations. So God's foreknowledge is, God's uh, 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 divine election is based on his own foreknowledge. Now we are going to talk about human volition. Because you are the one who is going to make that decision to be chosen by God. I hope this is not confusing to you. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. <laughs> if this is confusing to you, believe. You don't have to understand to believe. That's what faith is. <laughs> so you believe because the Bible says it is so, so it is so. The Bible tells us that the day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Which means you are the one who's going to make that decision when you hear his voice, not to harden your heart. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you will be the one making the decision to call upon the name of the Lord and then you will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe should not perish but have everlasting life. So whosoever believe, you are the one who's going to make the choice to believe. Now, Jesus Christ connects divine election and human volition in one verse in the Bible. He says, all that the Father gives me, all that the Father gives me, he says, shall come to me. And whosoever comes to me, I will by no wise cast away. So all the Father gives me is divine election. Whosoever comes to me, I will by no wise cast away is human volition. So do not sit down and be thinking, maybe God did not choose me from the foundation of the earth. No, when you hear the gospel and you respond to the gospel, that day you will find out that all this while, God chose you from the foundation of the earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we are in verse 5. He says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Hmm. So here, he is talking about, I have so many things to, to, to tell you, but I'm just trying to uh, put, it, put it together. Here he's talking about um, the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. He tells this church, he says, when we came to you with the message, we didn't come with fancy speeches. We didn't come to show off our oratorical qualities. But we spoke to you the word of God. And because we spoke the word of God to you, the Holy Spirit took over. And uh, he confirmed the word of God with uh, signs and miracles and uh, progress. And we can see this progress in this church. 
when he talked about the labor of love, the work of faith, and the patience of hope. This is the reason why we don't have uh, 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 progress in so many churches. For the simple reason that the people who are on the pulpit are just entertainers. Because they can make good speech, they can talk uh, eloquently. Uh, these churches will choose them to be their pastors and their teachers. Oftentimes, they will teach human doctrines and uh, human uh, 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 traditions. The things that Jesus Christ says makes the word of God of no effect. And because there is no word, there is no content to their messages, the power of the Holy Ghost is not in there to confirm the word of God with signs and miracles and progress taking place in these churches. They are devoured of the power of the Holy Ghost because the word of God is not taught in these places. It is telling us here to be conscious about where we receive the word of God from, who we listen to, where we go to church, because you can be a baby Christian for a long time because you are not fed the word of God. It is nothing wrong when you see a baby, a little baby with a feeding bottle in their hands. You know, they're sucking the thing and they're so excited and they're sucking and they're happy, you know. And nothing is wrong with that. But it becomes uh, uh, something weird. If you will see a 20 year old or 30 year old or 40 year old or even a 50 year old holding on to a feeding bottle with two hands, you know, having a strong grip on it and they won't let it go. You know, something is wrong. This is what happens when we attend places where they don't teach us the word of God, where we have entertainers, those who are making the church grow, but filled up with the spiritual babies. He tells you here, be like the Bereans. Because Paul compared the Bereans with the Thessalonica, the church at Thessalonica. He says they were noble more than the church at Thessalonica. Because when they received the word of God, they took the word of God with a readiness of heart. And when they went home, they searched out the scriptures. They looked, they looked. They said, is, is this thing true? Is it so? Is that what the word of God says? And, 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 they, and they made sure. Because the Bible says, prove all things. Hold fast that which is true. You are responsible to the, you are responsible of things that you allow to get into you. That is why it is very, very important to put your nose in the word of God so that you can tell when you are deceived. You don't want to run after running for a long time in one direction. And then you come, you, you found, you just, you just found out that you've been going in the wrong direction all this while. And then you got to turn around. You know, I have a personal experience on this. <laughs> when I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, a friend, he called me and we wanted to meet. So he gave me direction how to come to him. So, and he told me, he says, if, if you get to the highway signs, he says, take the first highway. And I did exactly what he told me. So I was driving, and I was driving in that direction. I was driving, and uh, uh, after two hours, the next thing I saw on the billboard was, Welcome to Alabama. <laughs> this is another state. <laughs> so I called him up on the phone. He said, no, 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 no. I think he went the wrong way. You got to turn around. And I have to drive another two and a half hours <laughs> just to meet up with him, you know. So you don't want to spend your time in a wrong place. This is the reason why I told you this. You don't want to run after you've run so many miles, so many years, and you come to find out that you are going in the wrong direction. He says, those who run, there are so many people who run. 
He says, but one only will receive the prize. He says, run therefore that you may obtain. Obtain the prize. Do not waste your time. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse um, 6, he says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became example to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. So here, Paul is talking about, he says, when they received the gospel, they did not let the gospel die in them. You see, they received the good news. They did not say, this is very good. I'm going to keep this. Oh, this is too good. I'm going to keep it for myself. He says, no, they didn't do that. Rather, they became transmitters of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They became a channel, an oasis of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when they had the good news, they knew, they knew, they knew, they knew that the, good, the, 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 the news was good. So they decided that I'm not going to keep this by myself. I want somebody else to hear about this. I want to get somebody else into this. This is what they did. And Paul is commending them here for this. What do we do with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? I know that when you get, when the day you got born again, you were translated from darkness into life by the power of the Holy Ghost. But what about other people? What about all that surround you? What about your colleagues at work? What about your relatives? What about your friends? Are you not going to share the gospel with them? Are you not going to help them embrace this good news that you have received? Are you not going to be that vessel or that channel that God will use to reach other people? This is the big question. You see, the kingdom of God is so big to accommodate everybody. So big. Do not plan to get in there only by yourself. The Bible tells us that those that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars. Don't let the gospel end with you. Try to reach out to other people. Now, let me tell you how you can reach out to other people. There are so many ways. Now, one of the ways is this. By praying for those who are not yet born again around you in the right way. What is the right way to pray for them? Don't pray for them don't pray to God to save them. That would not be appropriate. The reason is because salvation is already available. Jesus Christ has already made available salvation. All they have to do is receive the salvation. But the problem is, there is someone who has blinded their minds. Satan, the devil, and his own. Uh, a mystery. They are the ones that are keeping them from seeing the good news when they hear the good news to receive it with joy and gladness. So how do you pray for them? You break the power of darkness, the power of Satan over their lives in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Father, I break the power of darkness over, you mention his name, in the name of Jesus. When you break the power of darkness, then it makes it possible for them to hear the gospel and uh, receive it. Without breaking the power of darkness, they will hear it, but they will not act upon it. Because Satan is the one who is holding them in captivity against their own will. You see, God will respect your own will, but Satan doesn't. That's why God tells us to take them from him. That God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That they will recover themselves from the snail of the evil one who is holding them captivity against their own will. So you break the power of Satan over their lives. And now when they hear the gospel the next time, they will be able to make that decision to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Another way is by direct ministration. Utilizing every opportunity we have to minister to people. To tell them about Jesus Christ. To tell them about the good news. Do not make decisions for them and say, I don't think they're going to receive it. No, it is not your job. Your job is say it. Tell it. Spread it. And the, own, the, 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 you, you, the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to take that which you said to them. And then he will convict them of that one saying of the rejection of Jesus Christ. And when they are convicted, they will come into the kingdom of God. But you've done your own part. Paul says, I planted, but Apollos watered. It is, but God gave the increase. It is God, through the power of the Holy Ghost, who can give the increase and sustain that growth. It is God, through the power of the Holy Ghost, who can make that seed grow, to germinate and keep, sustain it the, and sustain the growth. So, do not make excuses for them. Remember the Bible tells us there is a day we're going to stand in, 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 the, in, in, in the judgment seat of Christ to receive rewards for the things which we done in the body. So there will be a day of rewards. You are, oh, faithful over a little thing. Here, here, I give you this many series. The day when God is going to, Jesus Christ is going to give a, 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 a rewards to everything we do for the kingdom of God. And those who have done nothing, he says, they're going to lose their own awards. Bible tells us not to lay our treasures down here on the earth. Where when you turn around, something is taking all those things you laid up and devour them. He says, rather, lay, your, lay up yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust corrupt, nor thieves will break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that also your heart will be. Be wise. Those that turn many to righteousness, they are wise. So do not let the gospel end with you. Share the good news. Bring in as many as possible. This is what is pleasing to God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. We are now in verse 9. He says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to do to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So now he's talking about the accomplishment of the Holy Ghost in the lives of these ones. They had the gospel. They embraced it with joy. And the Spirit of God confirmed it with uh, progress in their lives. And he says here, one of these things that they one of these things they did was they left their idol worships. Which was very prevalent in uh, Masado uh, or Th 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 Thessalonica at this time. And not only that, they left idolatry, they were focusing 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will save them from the wrath which is to come. This is very, very important. To put your mind on that one. That one alone. Who is able to keep you from falling. And present you faultless to the presence of the glory of God with a seed in joy. That one who is able to save you from the wrath which is to come. Now, what wrath is he talking about here? He's talking about the day of the Lord, the tribulation. Because when you were a Christian, when you received Jesus Christ, as your Lord and as your Savior, you are no longer appointed unto wrath. You will not go through tribulation. There are people who are, uh, 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 they, they, they have post-tribulation mentality because they think the Christians will go through tribulation. No, the Bible doesn't say so. Jesus Christ will come for his church. And we call that the rapture of the church. And after that come the seven years of tribulation. Now remember that the time appointed for Israel in the, the book of Daniel is 490 years. Out of the 490 years, 483 of them have been completed. And after the 483 years, the time of Israel went into pause. And then we came into the church era, the church age, the church dispensation. And that's where we are right now. But after Jesus Christ comes and he takes his church from this earth, the time of Israel will resume again. The last seven years, have, they will have to go through the last seven years. And we call this tribulation time. During this time, Oh, oh, you, if you read the book of Revelation, so many things will happen. Cataclysmic events. Cataclysmic events will go on. For in heaven, in this revelation, John sees Jesus Christ as he takes the scroll with the seven seals on it from the right hand of the Father. And every time he breaks one of this, uh, uh, the seals, a cataclysmic event happens on the earth. Punishment. Something happens. And when we get to the seventh seal, kicks in the seven trumpets. And every time the angel of God sounds the trumpet, something happens on the earth. Judgment is passed. When we get to the seventh trumpet, comes in the seven vials that will be poured upon the earth. It's going to be so, oh, it, it's going to be so bad that the kings and the princes, the rich, the slaves, the free on this earth, they're going to cry out to rocks and to mountains. They're going to tell them, cover us. Cover us from the face of the one who sits upon the throne. For the day of his wrath has come. And he's telling us here, he says, Jesus Christ is going to take you away from this tribulation. So you're not going to go through this tribulation. This is the joy these people had. They were so joyful about this yet to come experience. That's why this book is an eschatological epistle. Because it covers things that are yet to come in the future. So my friends, are you living your life every day with this expectation? That is the one who has already assured you that he will not let you go through tribulation. That he's going to take you away before this happens. Knowing fully that this will happen. And when you are in expectation of this, it will have an effect on the way you live your life. Every day. Not knowing when the master is going to show up. 
You don't want to be caught on her ways. <laughs> you want to be ready when the master comes, when the trumpet sounds. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he commends this church for their progress. The progress they made within a short period of time. And like I said earlier, this progress can never be possible. Couldn't have been possible if not by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe we covered everything. I've come to the end of today's teaching. And if you are listening to me, you are not yet born again. Now is an opportunity for you to give your life to Christ, to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And what it means to be born again is that you depend on only what Jesus Christ did for your salvation. You don't depend on your good effort or your own uh, behavior. Uh, you depend on the sacrifice that he sacrificed for you and I on the cross. And you receive that forgiveness of sin by faith. That's what it means to be born again. If you haven't done that, today is another opportunity. Uh, Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there is no other way you can do this. You cannot go around it. No other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, if not the name of Jesus Christ. If you belong to another religion and you have this concept that all roads lead to God, I want to encourage you today. I want to tell you the truth today, that that is not so. The only way that you will have access to God, the creator, if it is the God that you are talking about, the creator of the heaven and the earth, is through Jesus Christ. If you reject Jesus Christ, you're not going to have access to him. So Jesus says that I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone opens the door, he says, I will come in and I will eat with him and he will eat with me. What is he telling us here? You are the one who's going to make this decision. It's not going to be forced on, on, upon you. Because God created you that way to make decisions for yourself. The day you hear the gospel, do not harden your heart. For today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Do not prolong it any longer. Don't say, let me go get my acts together and then I come. I will receive Jesus. The time is very short. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. Just today alone, 155,000 people died in the world somewhere. Where did they go? If they failed to make this decision to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they will spend eternity in hell. A terrible place to spend eternity. We are there will be fire and brimstone for eternity. But if they chose Jesus Christ before they died as their Lord and their Savior, they will spend eternity in heaven. Friends, what are you waiting for? You've made preparation for the things of this earth. How are you going to retire? What about eternity? For the time here is very short. If you live too long, you live 100 years or 120 years. But what happens after that? Be wise. Prepare for the future. The place that you will spend eternity. For everything we see in this world, someday will be dissolved. They will be destroyed. Jesus says, if you don't believe that I am he, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. He that believes in the Son has life. But he that believes not will not see life. As a matter of fact, he says, the wrath of God abides in him already. For he that, doesn't, he that does not believe is already condemned. For the simple reason that he does not believe in the name, the only name of the begotten Son of God. Friends, I will lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer and you mean it, you're going to be right now translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray this prayer. 
Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son, that he died for my sins, that you raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe I am now born again. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I give you all the glory for this. Friends, if you pray that prayer, I welcome you into the kingdom of God. Find a good church where they teach the word of God. Be a member of that church that you can grow in your faith. For faith will come by hearing the word of God. Buy a Bible and study and uh, put your nose in the word of God so that you will grow stronger and stronger every day. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world, those helping us to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you so much. For he that turns many to righteousness is wise. Remember, it's only those who hear the word of God and they put the word of God in practice. They are the ones who get the benefits of the word of God. I pray for you this day. May the Lord be with you and bless you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you revelation knowledge of his word and give you peace and strength even in the midst of turmoil and give you prosperity and divine health and bless your week. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, surely there is an end and your own expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Yes, Kalabon, Grodowski, Inkalapata. Vela Enkrenesto Ujeuske Parapate Piarukoti. E de Grande Mosco Bujes Santam Kurukoti Do. In a great garama, she had a garabatel, a jungle, those of Ushkepa and Glantis.